It's a similar story in southern Scotland, cloudy for most, with patchy rain in the northwest and some heavy showers, mainly in the east of the country. In contrast, Northern Ireland will have a mixed bag of sunny spells and scattered showers this afternoon. The showers turning heavy at times, but many places remaining dry throughout. It'll stay cloudy with outbreaks of rain in the north and northwest, drier with evening sunny spells and scattered showers elsewhere. And that's how the weather is shaping up for the rest of the day. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome. This is Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes, on Telly, DAB and online. Today we're going to be discussing footballers. Should they be forced to wear a rainbow in solidarity with the LGBT community? Also, it looks like we won't be going cashless just yet. Access to cash is set to be protected under a new law. A law that was announced in the Queen's speech. But first, here's the news with Bethany Elsie. Thanks, Darren. Good afternoon. It's just gone two o'clock. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB Newsroom. The Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers Union says any attempt by the government to make rail strike action illegal will be met with the fiercest resistance. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps told the Sunday Telegraph ministers are considering introducing a minimum staff requirement during rail strikes. It's as more than 40,000 RMT union members at Network Rail and train operators vote on whether to take industrial action over jobs, pay and conditions. Two cabinet ministers have objected to imposing a windfall tax on oil and gas firms. Labour says the tax revenue can be used to ease the burden of rising household bills. But the Health Secretary and the Northern Ireland Secretary says it won't work and could have long-term impact on businesses. While Greg Marsh, the CEO of Noose, a company which is helping families navigate the cost of living crisis, told GB News regulators could do more to stop rising energy costs. 
We believe that the government will have to do more. We think that there will need to be intercession. One of the things they could do, for instance, is use the existing regulators, Ofcom and Ofgem, who regulates the communications industry and the energy industry, to put more pressure on the regulated providers of energy, the regulated providers of mobile phone services and broadband services to ensure that those companies aren't increasing their prices above the rate of inflation, which is something many of them are doing. 10 says the Prime Minister did not request a meeting with senior civil servant Sue Gray and that he hasn't tried to influence the outcome of her investigation into Partygate in any way. Labour called on Boris Johnson to urgently explain what they discussed, with Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner saying people deserve to know the truth. Ukraine has ruled out a ceasefire or concessions to Moscow as Russian forces intensify an offensive in the eastern region of Donbass. US President Joe Biden has signed a bill to provide £30 billion in military, economic and humanitarian aid to the country. Meanwhile, the Kremlin has cut off its gas supply to Finland after they refused Moscow's demand to pay in rubles. Ukraine's presidential adviser says Kyiv wouldn't accept any deal that involves giving up territory. Any concession to the Russian Federation would instantly lead to an escalation of the war. So the war will not stop. It will just be put on pause for some time. After a while, with renewed intensity, the Russians will build up their weapons, manpower and work on their mistakes. And they'll start a new offensive, even more bloody and large scale. The Education Secretary has said he's determined to make personal tutoring free to every pupil. In the Sunday Express, Nadim Zahawi said one-on-one -on -one teaching could become a part of the national curriculum to help those who've fallen behind during the pandemic. Kerry Rapp-Packman, Executive Director of ParentKind, told GB News parents don't have enough information to take advantage of the scheme. A woman launching a legal battle in Northern Ireland after waiting five years for a diagnosis says she hopes her case will help others. Eileen Wilson has yet to be formally diagnosed after being referred by her GP in June 2017. She was showing symptoms of MS. All she wants is face-to-face -face appointments with a consultant. The mother of six will argue the length of the waiting list is unlawful and breaches human rights. It's just not knowing. It's just that constant fear. There's people dying in waiting lists and it's, it's just not, it's not fair. You know, those people can't get appointments. Even cancer patients can't get appointments. It's just horrible. Five years on from the Manchester Arena terror attack and more than 20,000 people have taken part in the Great Manchester Run in memory of the victims. Mayor Andy Burnham has been among those paying tribute. 22 people were killed and hundreds injured when a bomb detonated at an Ariana Grande concert in May 2017. Australia's Labour Party will form the country's new government from tomorrow, making way for a greener way of living. Voters campaigning for climate change targeted seats held by Scott Morrison's Liberal Party, ending nine years of Conservative coalition. Local media reports Labour, which hasn't been in power since 2013, is just short of a majority of 76 seats. And they may need support of a smaller independent party. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now, let's get back to Darren. Hello and welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Here's what's coming up on the show. We'll be discussing whether or not footballers should be forced to wear a rainbow. Last week, Idris Agana Guy missed the French side Paris Saint-Germain win because he refused to wear a shirt featuring the rainbow flag. Should players be forced to wear these political symbols? We're going to be debating that very topic. I'll also be joined in the studio by the former Director General of the British Chamber of Commerce and now Chairman of the Foundation for Independence, John Longworth. 
The Chancellor said this week the government wants to cut biz tax for business, but will they actually do it? John will discuss. And are you worried about a cashless society? New government legislation will seek to protect access to cash. We learnt this week. So we'll be putting cash machines through our Scrap Reform Keep segment. Is the death of cash inevitable? That's what we're talking about for the next hour. But as always, I would absolutely love to know your thoughts on footballers wearing rainbow colours. Would you rather we keep this out of our beautiful game? Tweet me at GB News or you can email me on GBviews at GBnews.uk. You can watch us online on YouTube and don't forget Facebook. Loads of brilliant content on our GB News page. Cheers very much. Now, folks, it's easy, isn't it, to dismiss conversations around sex and gender as being nothing more than frivolous culture war issues that are exclusively the preserve of activists that spend far too much time on Twitter. And as David Cameron reportedly once said, too many tweets make a... I won't finish that sentence on the Lord's Day, but you get me drift. Too often, conversations around a tiny minority of people in our country and an even smaller, very vocal minority of that group that identifies transgender are dismissed as being unimportant to the majority. The demands for the right to self-determine your gender and change the sex on your birth certificate, the right to enter a woman's bathroom, the right to play as a biological male, in women's sports, these things are dismissed as Twitter topics that don't impact millions of women out there in the real world. But folks, take the NHS. Only this week, we heard from the Daily Mail that official NHS advice about ovarian womb and cervix cancers have removed the word women from their website, changing three sections explaining that these cancers are exclusively found in biological women, using resources to target messaging and services at men might make some feel included, but ultimately harm biological women seeking checks. So good news, right, in my view, that the Telegraph report today that the government is expected to announce that it's rewriting guidance on drafting legislation to make clear that gender-neutral language shouldn't replace terms such as woman and mother. But how did laws drafted in this way, such as the ministerial and other maternity allowances bill last year, get through in the first place? And why is the Ministry of Justice recording female sex offending statistics that include crimes by people born male, as well as exclusively male types of sexual crimes such as rape, you know, penetration with a penis, Historically, men have actually committed 99% of sex offences. How on earth can we seek to protect women from these crimes when we don't even know how many male sex offenders are identifying as women? It's a serious, serious issue that feeds through much deeper than arguments on social media platforms like Twitter. We also have gender politics wreaking havoc in the education system, with both staff and pupils absolutely terrified to express a view. This weekend, the Times reports on a private school sixth form pupil who said she was hounded out of her school and treated like a heretic for questioning gender ideology. There's been an increase of several thousands percent in girls being referred for life-changing transition and treatment in the past decade. Referrals often occur in clusters at certain schools and we, we have to make sure that women are free to speak out and raise the alarm if they fear that children are at risk. Despite the threat, the demonization and the abuse, some cultural titans like JK Rowling, for example, and a number of brave females in sport, champions of sport, have risked it all to actually speak up. They've lost friends, they've lost lucrative deals, fashionable accolades. But why? 
would they bother if this was just a storm in a Twitter teacup? The government is obsessed with protecting oppressed groups, but gender critical women and girls who are fighting for the well-being of their sex are now facing genuine oppression. And the government has been really slow to act. A conservative government, in my view, with an 80 seat majority, should strip activism out of education, the NHS and elsewhere. Make clear in your instruction to civil servants and others that to suggest sex and gender are different isn't a transphobic notion. Teachers and pupils ought to not be bullied out of schools because you watched a video suggesting Arthur can be Martha at the click of your fingers. The fish rots from the head. It's time for the government to get a grip. But I imagine my guests first up here might disagree. Our first story this week, Jake Daniels, a Blackpool player, he came out as gay. So what? And many of you have written to me and said, so what? But he's the first, you see, he's the first player to come out in the UK in 30 years. And only the second out professional footballer in the world currently. The other is in, Aus in Australia and only recently actually came out. So does the beautiful game have an issue with gay men? That's my culture all today, and it's time to hear a range of views, I'm delighted to say. I'm joined by Stuart Waiton, senior lecturer at Abertay University, and Peter Tatchell, LGBTQ activist and the director of the Peter Tatchell Foundation. Peter, thank you very much for your company. Can I start with you? I'm sure you'll agree with me that 30 years is an incredibly long time. And I think, Peter, well, we won't disagree, actually, that there is a cultural problem, isn't there, in football, where people feel that actually coming out could be a threat to pursuing a really top-set career. Well, you are, you're absolutely right. Um, there are approximately 5,000 professional footballers in the UK. And as of now, Jake Daniels is the only one who's open about his sexuality, despite the fact that statistically there probably are about 500 gay or bisexual players who are professional footballers. So it is really surprising, uh, all the more surprising because recent surveys have shown that three quarters of football fans wouldn't care less if a player on their team came out. All they care about is, will the player score goals? And I think we should be focusing on honesty, truth, and integrity in football, and not on people's sexuality. And I think it's great that Jake has given a lead, and I hope that others will follow, because there are lots and lots of others. And then you've heard what Peter's had to say there. There's clearly a cultural problem with the sport. So why not put the rainbow out there? Why not advocate equality and diversity in our beautiful game? Um. Well, you know, I think you could promote all sorts of things. Um, uh, football, I mean, personally, I think uh, football's being swamped by uh, kind of awareness raising. Um, I don't think football's particularly the place to do it. Uh, and I think historically, there was an argument that you should keep sport and politics separate. Um, but increasingly, it seems that people in authority and football authorities uh, have completely given up on that and want to promote um, whatever the, the latest campaign that they're interested in doing it. And the problem I have with it is that it feels like an enforcement of values. Uh, it's a sort of taking the name. Uh, and, I, and I take Peter's point, uh, although I'm not sure to what extent the footballers coming out or not coming out reflects a problem of homophobia, which again, I mean, there's a book on this. I don't know if Peter's figures are similar to the book that's been written about uh, homophobia in football, which makes the conclusion from their research that actually football fans are pretty much like, you know, what you'd expect is they don't really care. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I'm, I, 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 the first ever left wing newspaper I ever sold was in the revolutionary hotbed of Kingston upon Thames. And it was in defence of gay rights, and that was that was 30 years ago. And I think it's been one of the greatest changes in British culture and Western culture that we now 
basically accept that gay people uh, should be free, equal, etc., etc., and everything else. And, and I suspect if you asked football players uh, and fans, they would say something similar. So I think I think the question you're raising about why the footballers not come out. I mean, I played football and I played football, at, um, and and I can tell you that foot, being a, a a bloke in a changing room in a football atmosphere is a blokey kind of atmosphere, and I suspect that's part of the reason that uh, gay men do not particularly want right. to come out. I think it's also that people might just want to have a private life. Um, and uh, you know, I, and they, they think that some of the fans might take the mick, and they just don't want to give okay. them that opportunity. I, I don't think it necessarily means that football is drenched in um, homophobia, like society is. So, Peter, on that point, then, on what Stuart has just said there, do you think that ultimately we have moved on as a society? Most people say, "I don't care," so you know, don't. Why do you feel the need to come out? A lot of people are saying we shouldn't wear the rainbow colours because actually we're accepting of all of this in society. Just leave it all alone and get on with your lives. Well, first of all, this is not a political issue. It's a human rights issue. It's how we want to have a kinder, gentler, more inclusive society where everyone feels welcome. The problem is that historically, gay and bisexual men have been deterred to either play football or go to football matches because it was in the past a very homophobic experience. Um, as I said, the number of fans who are anti-gay now is, 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 is probably only about a quarter of fans, but that is still a sizable minority. And we know that um, football clubs like Brighton, for example, regularly get jibes, um, homophobic jibes from rival fans. So it is a problem and players do fear that if they come out, they'll be subjected to taunts, which okay. will put them off the game. Um, they also fear rejection by teammates. But again, the Professional Footballers Association has said loud and clear that they fully support players if they come out. And that's what we want. We want to have sport that's an equal playing field where people are judged on merit, not on their, on their sexuality. And we know that lots of straight footballers regularly brag about their girlfriends and wives and go on holidays with them. But why shouldn't gay footballers be able to do the same? OK. So, Stuart, do you think ultimately this is actually a, a, an issue where the Twitter classes, for example, sneer at the game itself, right? They view football fans as being thick, ignorant, bigoted working classes who just wouldn't get this sort of thing. So actually you need to wear a rainbow in order to actually change their point of view. Is that what this is? Yeah, I think there's an element of snobbery involved in it, not just on this issue, but the race issue is even more clear where, um, you know, so I watch Sky, I watch a lot of football and so on. And, you know, you get these flashing, almost like subliminal messages about be, be against racism, flash across your screen. And the thing is, I, I agree with um, Peter's sentiment, but I think if, if there was a different type of message being flashed across your screen, you would probably think this is, this is a kind of form of Maoism, you know, where you're trying to change the values, you know, to educate yourself, and you constantly have this at football. And the thing is, it's not really education, it's a kind of dogma, it's a kind of okay. wagging finger. Right, which is constantly done. And this, the, the, the footballer that you mentioned in, um, in France, I mean, I think you have a situation there where a Muslim footballer doesn't want to wear anything to do with... Which, uh, in my view, we shouldn't rights. have to, right? I don't think anyone should ultimately be coerced to do anything that they don't want to. It's a fundamental that's right. and that's, value. That's, that's, where, that's where we find a problem. Yeah, we find a problem where basic basic freedoms like freedom of conscience of an individual yeah. are Stuart, being I'm... forced upon him. And he is meant to, to adopt a belief that he doesn't believe in in, right. in what is his workplace, which is to me is quite authoritarian and worrying. Peter, sadly, I've only got a few seconds left, but I just want to give you a chance to respond to that point. Well, let's just say there was a white racist player who refused to... Uh, acknowledge and support black players. We wouldn't accept that. We would say that there is no place in football for racism. And I think we should have the same attitude 
towards homophobia, a zero tolerance. And I think wearing rainbow laces or lanyards, um, that is not a political issue. It's a human rights issue. And it's, I've got it's also the authoritarian. Got, You're being I've authoritarian. Got, You're trying to force your values on other people. OK, folks, I'm sorry. We're going to have to leave it there and agree to disagree. That was Stuart Wheaton, the author, academic and football writer, and Peter Tatchell, the LGBTQ activist. Thank you very much for your time today. Now, folks, there's plenty more to come this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we'll be talking about the Black Lives Matter movement. An investigation has found that they use 4.5 million quid in donations to buy a California mansion. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking fine with some late sunshine in the southeast, but cloudier and wetter elsewhere. Here's the details. A closer look at the southwest and here it's going to turn cloudier by the evening with some outbreaks of rain likely, particularly for Cornwall and North Devon. In the southeast and around London, it will be a decent end to the day with some late sunshine for most here. Cloud will bring some rain across the parts of Wales this evening. It shouldn't be too heavy though, and there will be some breaks in the cloud. A similar picture for the West Midlands, where things will be a little damp due to a few spots of rain pushing in from the west. For many, it's going to be cloudy. It will be a little brighter, perhaps, in the northeast of England. There should be some evening sunshine around, but also a few showers, which could be a touch heavy. Across much of Scotland, it will be a wet end to the day with the heaviest rain in the northwest. Some localised flooding is possible as we go through the night. It will be something of a mixed bag for Northern Ireland with some bright or sunny spells, but also a little showery rain lingering through the evening and overnight. The heaviest rain will clear Scotland overnight, but further outbreaks here and for Northern Ireland too, turning drier for England and Wales. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions. Big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners. The paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Hello and welcome back to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. Now, coming up on the show, we're going to be discussing to Nick Buckley. And we're going to be discussing with him about this story here. The leaders of the largest organisation in Black Lives Matter. They, folks, have used £4.5 million in donations to buy a California mansion. An investigation has actually discovered this. It's a story that's causing a ripple on the other side of the Atlantic. But as we all know, BLM had an absolutely huge impact here. Do you remember all those riots? In the UK, with a wave of activism and, frankly, criminality across the channel here in the UK from the US in 2020. So my next guest, Nick, was one of those who felt the really sharp end, frankly, of that divisive movement. But what's going on? And is the saintly BLM movement going rotten? Well, I'm delighted to say Nick Buckley, MBE, a former youth intervention officer and former CEO of Mancunian Way, joins me now. Nick, thank you very much for your company. I mean, you are the ideal guest to speak about this and the latest on this story because they, it, this movement almost cost you everything, didn't it? It did, absolutely. And I warned about this two years ago at the height of Black Lives Matter in May and June 2020. I looked into the organisation, only took me 10 minutes, and I said to myself, I don't like the sound of any of this. Spoke to my family and friends, they didn't know anything about the organisation, what their aims were, um, dismantling capitalism, getting rid of the nuclear family. Um, and I put a, a blog out just to tell people the facts I found on their own website. And for that crime, I was branded a racist, sacked out of the charity I founded. Um, and that was how I became infamous. <laughs> Well, it certainly did, and thank goodness, because you got involved with the Free Speech Union, who, which I would advocate everyone sign up to. I think they're brilliant. But the, the accusations against BLM in the US now, Nick, do you think that the gloss, the sheen, has been well and truly rubbed off of this outfit? Do you actually think that they've been exposed now? Yeah, and I think the exposing started over a year ago. You know, we had the scandal last year of Black Mansions Matter, the founder of Black Lives Matter owns four really expensive houses. People didn't like the look of that, and no one knew where the money came from. Now we have their tax returns basically coming in now, um, and people are looking at that and, and saying, I didn't donate money to you for you to spend my money on these things. Now, technically, they may not have broken any laws. I don't know anything about US law. So everything they've spent the money on might be legitimate, but that's not the point. When you're donating to a charitable cause, you don't expect them to buy a $6 million mansion in California or buy one, exactly the same one, in Toronto in Canada. You don't expect them to be feathering their own nests, which that's what it looks like. They may not have broken any laws, but people are really annoyed that they're not helping the communities. They said they were going to help. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's fundamentally the point. And, of course, it is worth saying that Black Lives Matter do actually deny that they, there has been any abuse of, of cash and that this, this one mansion was at least bought for the purposes of the organisation to use and utilise and continue its work. But speaking of continuing that work, Nick, just briefly, I wonder if you can set out how, in your charitable work, how actually you've come to the view that Black Lives Matter ultimately harms race relations? Oh, loads and loads of examples. And Black Lives Matter just happened to be the pinnacle of this, which is basically race baiting and race grifting. There's a lot of money to be made in this. There's a lot of money to be made of turning one group of people against another. And this is a centuries old game people play for power and for money. Um, we're doing it with race, we're doing it with sexuality, we're doing it with religions. We've always done it with religions, by the way. Um, so some of the things you can see now going on, I only know about our country, so, so we'll leave the US uh, for another day. But in our country now, the reason why we have young black men dying on the streets, especially in London, is through racism. The people killing them are not racist because they have other young black men. But the reason why the government and the police won't tackle this issue 
is because they're scared of being branded as racist. So you have professionals saying to themselves and politicians, I would rather these young black men die in pools of their own blood than me to be accused of being a racist and ruining my career. Now that's racism, but that's an acceptable face of it because nobody wants to tackle it. Mm. And there's a lot of other examples we can give where people are being harmed in this society through so-called kindness and compassion. And it needs to stop because it's not kindness and compassion. It's lunacy. Well, Nick, I think that was a perfect way to end that discussion. Nick Buckley, former Youth Intervention Officer and former CEO of Mancunian Way, thank you very much for your insight and view on that issue there. Now, folks, is a with GB News on Telly and DAB Radio. Next, I'm going to be joined by the chairman of the Foundation for Independence, who was also the former Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, John Longworth. I'll be getting his thoughts on the health of our economy and inflation being at 9%. People are really struggling at the minute. But first, folks, it's time for a check on the news headlines with Bethany. Thanks, Darren. It's 33 minutes past two. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. The Rail Maritime and Transport Workers Union says any attempt by the government to make rail strike action illegal will be met with the fiercest resistance. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps told the Sunday Telegraph ministers are considering introducing a minimum staff requirement during rail strikes. More than 40,000 RMT union members are voting on whether to take major industrial action over pay. Two cabinet ministers have objected to imposing a windfall tax on oil and gas firms as a plan to tackle the cost of living crisis. Labour says the tax revenue could be used to ease the burden of rising household bills. But the Health Secretary and the Northern Ireland Secretary say it won't work and could have long-term impact on businesses. Number 10 says the Prime Minister did not request a meeting with senior civil servant Sue Gray and that he hasn't tried to influence the outcome of her Partygate investigation. Labour called on Boris Johnson to urgently explain what they'd discussed, with Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner saying people deserve to know the truth. Ukraine has ruled out a ceasefire or concessions to Moscow as Russian forces intensify an offensive in the eastern region of Donbass. Ukraine's presidential adviser says Kiev wouldn't accept any deal that involves giving up territory. Meanwhile, the Kremlin has cut off its gas supply to Finland after they refused Moscow's demands to pay in rubles. And Australia's Labour Party will form the country's new government from tomorrow, making a way for a greener way of living. Voters campaigning for climate change targeted seats held by Scott Morrison's Liberal Party, ending nine years of Conservative coalition. Local media reports Labour is just shy of a majority 76 seats and may need support from smaller independent parties. On TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll get back to Darren Grimes in just a moment. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot. 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. 
Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Co. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Now, folks, Rishi Sunak vowed to cut taxes for business to tackle the cost of living crisis during a speech at the CBI, the Confederation of B British Industry, this week. And there's been a pandemic. The Tories have been in power for over a decade and taxes are at a 70-year high with inflation surging. So why should we trust the Chancellor here that actually they are going to cut our taxes. Sir John Redwood, the renowned Thatcherite MP, a big fan of cutting red tape and taxes, a former minister, he had a very clear message for Rishi. He said, raise universal credit, cancel the national insurance rise, suspend VAT on fuel, end the threat of higher business taxes, cut council tax. These are necessary to ease the squeeze and to stop future job losses. But will Rishi be Liz, actually lending John Redwood and my next guest a supportive ear. Well, we'll find out. I'm joined now by John Longworth, a former Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce, currently the chair... The organisation... It's Independent Business Network of Family Business. Which everyone can find out all about. Now, John, tell me a little bit about this foundation. What are you guys actually doing? Well, we're it's supported by family businesses. Uh, fam family businesses represent 85% of businesses in the UK, if you include sole traders. So very different from the work the CBI is doing. Very different. And, of course, they're not very well represented by organisations like the CBI, who tend to represent multinationals, including foreign multinationals, who have vested interests. The real backbone of the economy and the growth sector, of course, in entrepreneurs uh, and innovators is in fact family businesses, mm -hmm. people who own their own businesses. And they're the ones that the government should be asking for opinions on how to run the economy. Right. Now, John, I wanted to ask you about Sajid Javid and Brendan, Brandon Lewis, the, shadow, uh, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. They are reportedly not in favour of a windfall tax on energy companies. Now, John, many of my viewers today will be of the view, opening their energy bills, letting out an audible gasp, thinking, mm. how am I going to manage this? It, especially given that it's going to go up when the price cap is raised mm. to actually reflect the rise in cost of gas and all the rest of it. Why shouldn't there be a windfall tax to actually take some of the profits from these energy giants and put them in the pockets of hard-pressed British consumers? Because it's theft. Windfall taxes uh, create instability, they reduce investment in the economy because nobody's going to invest in an economy where some robber government can come along and take the money off of you at the drop of a hat. Tax needs to be predictable and within a framework. Of course, people are right to gasp at the energy bills, but there are other ways that the government should have dealt with this. Most of the energy bills increases that have occurred so far are nothing to do with the Ukraine mm. and the, the war that's going on. They're to do entirely with the government's wrong-headed approach to net zero. Do you think they... that's also the case with inflation, John, that actually, you know, this is, goes much deeper than Ukraine? Oh, yeah, much deeper. Uh, inflation is obviously being exacerbated by Ukraine. But again, the wrong-headed approach to net zero was the way in which uh, the inflation spiral started to, to be kicked off mm. because the government's chosen the most expensive route 
to net zero. We've got ample supplies of gas and oil, in particular gas in the North Sea and under our feet. Mm -hmm. We could frack. It would last 100 years. What we should be doing is doing exactly that, using that gas as a bridge to a, a nuclear future. There is no way in the world that we're going to get to a point where the vast majority of our energy is provided by wind farms and solar panels. Well, quite. Definitely not solar panels in Yorkshire, where I live. Mm -hmm. And wind farms, we'd have to cover the entire country and we still wouldn't have enough energy. And actually, they're very expensive. So what we need to do is to frack and extract gas from the North Sea for the, at least the next 20 years until we've got a nuclear industry that's been fully developed. So put in the energy policy and energy failures, in your opinion, John, to one side. Were it in my gift, and I'm not Her Majesty the Queen, but were it in my gift to make you Chancellor of the Exchequer, what would be the first thing that you do to actually help alleviate the burden on consumers and actually, as you rightly say, small family-owned businesses Absolutely. in this country that are struggling right now yeah. and wondering how they're going to actually heat their homes and put food on the table? Well, there are short-term measures, the ones that John Redwood mentioned that you said earlier on, things like the VAT on fuel, uh, reversing the national insurance increase, reducing business rates. You know, we have a crazy situation still with business rates where if, go if companies invest in manufacturing machinery, their business rates go up. Yeah. I mean, it's absolute madness. Yeah. So there are short-term measures. But the government's made huge mistakes in terms of long-term economic measures, which no need to be rectified. We ought to be reducing corporation tax to attract investment. It's British companies that pay corporation tax. Multinationals avoid it by registering their companies elsewhere in Luxembourg or other overseas uh, domains. So let's support British businesses by reducing corporation tax. That's one of the biggest things they would do. Deregulation. We've seen no deregulation yet. And, of course, the thing that would really reduce the cost of living for consumers instantly and actually produce competition and growth in the UK economy is the removal of tariffs on imported goods. There are lots of imported goods that we don't produce in the UK. If we remove tariffs unilaterally on those goods, it will reduce the cost of living overnight. A lot of these goods are charged tariffs at 20 to 40 per cent. But we that's saw. Huge. Do you really think that that's true, though? Because we removed the, or lowered at least, the price at the pump. Well, we should have been yeah. able to do that. Yeah. Now, that wasn't reflected at the pump. No, there's another thing going on with respect to that. I mean, first, that wasn't a tariff, of course, that was, yeah. that was a tax. Yeah. But what's happened in the UK petrol retailing sector is there's been a reduction in competition. The Competition and Markets Authority identified this potential problem when ASDA, which is the price setter for petrol, or was in the UK, was acquired by uh, an independent group right. who already own petrol stations. Okay. There's now no incentive for petrol retailers to compete with each other and reduce petrol prices. There should actually be a competition inquiry. More competition, more choice for consumers, I'm all for it. But on the point of more competition and more choice, you made a choice as an MEP <laughs> to defect to the Conservative Party from the Brexit Party. Looking at the state of the Conservative Party now, mm. Do you regret making that? No, decision? not at all. I mean, Boris, the only choice we had if we wanted to get Brexit done was to actually elect Boris Johnson's Conservative Party. We've got to remember, reflecting back, that the whole problem of the Northern Ireland Protocol and all the things that are going on at the moment is entirely at the door of the administration of Theresa May and Philip Hammond and a quizzling parliament which was blocking us leaving the EU. So we had to get over that line. It was conscious on my part. I knew exactly what I was doing and I knew that there was a problem with the Northern Ireland Protocol. There's provisions within the protocol to actually reverse those problems lawfully, but the EU are resisting it mendaciously because they're actually not our friends. Yeah. And the UK should take it in its own hands, whatever the US Congress leader Pelosi says, which is all What if Boris air. Johnson U-turns on a windfall tax? Well, 
I think that would be completely wrong. You know, the government have got to get a grip. Well, and they've got to uh, de de demonstrate some courage. Yeah. On all these issues. I think he will, you know, and, and Dominic Cummins, uh, his former famous advisor of Durham, he actually reckons that Boris Johnson is a trolley because he actually U-turns with a dodgy wheel far too often. <laughs> so we'll see, John. But John Longworth, thank you very much for Pleasure. your time. Now, folks, that was John Longworth, chairman of the... Independent Business Network of Family Businesses. Which people can find out about online. Online, they have a website. Perfect. Do that, folks. Really important work. But now, folks, it's time for our Scrap, Reform and Keep segment. And today, we're going to be looking at cash machines. This week, the government told banks that they'll be forced to keep a minimum number of cash machines and cash deposit facilities open across the country. But as we move toward being a cashless society, I cannot remember personally the last time I used cash. Is it right? Should we just scrap cash machines altogether? Well, I'm delighted to say that joining me now is Catherine McBride, a fellow at the Centre for Brexit Policy, and she joins me now. Catherine, thank you very much for your company. Research actually shows by the website money.co.uk that the UK decline of, of cash machines is more than matched by the decline in other European countries. Why is it? Are the UK consumers just saying, I don't want to touch this stuff anymore? Yes, I do think that there there is um, UK consumers have adopted this new idea. Uh, debit card tapping has taken over cash. Um, it's it's expensive to run cash machines. Um, bank branches are closing everywhere. Something like a third of our bank branches have closed in the last five years, and we'd already seen a lot of closures before that. So if a bank can't keep the whole branch open, and that the cash machine requires secure deliveries of cash on a daily basis, um, which is also quite expensive. I, I have trouble understanding why the government even thinks that it's a good idea to try and force companies to do that. I mean, some of the big supermarket chains like Sainsbury's and Tesco have banks. And so in their shops, they operate, um, they have cash machines and at the tills, you can get cash back when you pay with the card if you actually need cash. But I'm like you, I, I hardly use cash these days. So I... I but um, Catherine, I though, the, I guess the, for many viewers watching now, I guess the concern would be that older people often don't have or don't actually access themselves electronic bank and they might not have the means or the know-how to actually do that. So what can the government do? And I know you're not a natural ally of government intervention, but isn't surely this right? that the government ensures that there is access to cash for older generations? Well, I, I will see when the bill comes out, we'll be able to look at the detail of how they're proposing to do this. But I really don't see how they can force a bank to keep a bank machine open uh, if it's not viable, if it's not... Because um, these uh, ATMs are free to take money out, so you don't pay for it. There are machines in quite a few uh, smaller corner shops near me that are not free so that they charge something either to the shop or to the user and maybe that's the way it goes. But, but who pays for it? You know, eventually we probably do. Um, and uh, in, in my mother's dotage uh, in her 90s, she would write everyone checks. Yeah. She was hardly ever use cash either because she didn't want to go to the bank to get cash out, you know. Well, well Catherine, I think a lot of people are also quite sceptical about being without cash in case anything ever happens. You know, I don't want to sound like a, a conspiracy theorist, but they like to have a reserve to rely upon. So with that said, do you actually want to scrap to... I would like, I'd love to add that keep? something because it yes, doesn't do. give you any security. Okay. Um, sorry to interrupt, but the... Not at all. Um, no, because in Canada, the government obviously went AWOL in February this year and they closed yeah. a whole lot of bank accounts of the truckers that they didn't agree yeah. with and, and people who donated to them. But in 2016, the Indian government just cancelled the large denominations of 500 and 1,000 rupee notes 
because they decided that they were only being used in ah, the black economy. So even even so, if you rely on a, a if you rely yeah. on a government currency, it doesn't actually matter okay. if it's um, cash or if it's a bank account. If We're going to have to leave it, it there. Catherine McBride, a very interesting point to end on. Thank you very much. Catherine McBride there, and, and a fellow so scrap. at the Centre for Brexit Policy. Scrap. <laughs> yes. Now, folks, Sorry. it's time you for Campus Clash. Thank you, Catherine. We've had Jacob Rees-Mogg poke fun at civil servants who seem reluctant to get back into the office for work as they prefer to stay at home. I wonder why. So it's time to ask, is working from home the future? Or indeed, studying from home? So joining me to discuss is the law student Jules Chan and pr prospective university student Jude Lavos. Jude, can I start with you, please? Why are you of the view that there are significant advantages to working from home? Uh, I believe in giving workers choice to work where they like, as long as their job allows for that sort of thing. Of course, there are certain jobs like working in a restaurant. You obviously can't do that from home. Uh, but something like a civil service job, there are a lot of things that you can do from home. And the job is, is you know, it is that way. Uh, my dad is in the civil service and he worked a lot from home during the pandemic. And he was able to do his job just as well as he could in the office and, you know, be as productive as he was in the office, even more so in some cases, because there are less distractions around. So you're telling me that your dad wasn't just dressed from halfway up? No, no, no. He was, uh, you know, taking his job as seriously as he does in the office. You know, he was okay. waking up, getting on the laptop, sometimes even earlier than he would in the office. Yeah. Um, and it gave, you know, it gives you more time to, to get ready in the mornings. You don't have to worry about transport. You don't have to worry about coming home and all this sort of stuff. It's, I think it, it works a lot better in certain jobs. So, Jules, then, why do you actually think that Jacob Rees-Mogg is onto something here and uh, people like Jude's father uh, are actually should be able to work from home and continue to be as productive as they would be otherwise? Well, I think it's um, proponents of these kind of ideas of working from home are kind of taking a very myopic view of the economy as a whole. We've built an entire sector that caters to people working in offices, essentially. Uh, people do seem to want to work in offices. And more importantly, we're talking about, let's say, moving everyone in the workforce to home would also mean all the janitorial staff, all of the office letting spaces, all of the coffee shops that cater to those office workers. Everything around that sector would immediately yeah. see a demand shift, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, more importantly, we're talking about public transports as well and all that kind of thing, which would effectively branch out. It's, it's not just about the worker it's also okay, Jules, do you actually yeah. think that there would be a benefit, though, if all of a sudden in London and areas like it, for example, where young people, people of your generation, probably don't stand a chance for at least some time of getting on the housing ladder? If there's all of a sudden all of this real estate of these empty offices, surely, actually, you'd benefit from the fact that this could be turned into housing? I mean... Well, first of all, that's ignoring a lot of planning permissions and stuff. Perhaps that's deregulation is the way to go for the government in that regard. But regardless of that, we do. But it's need very easy space. to convert these offices, isn't it? So isn't Jude right that actually there's an opportunity here to be seized? I don't think it's particularly easy to convert a lot of these offices because they aren't, especially in places that are easily kind of livable residential areas. I mean, if you look at the average business park, they're not necessarily kind of created in a way. And there's reasons why we kind of do different zoning laws for different kind of um, areas. And that's because we have uh, ideas on which kind of areas are okay. suitable for residential spaces. We're just one minute away from the end of this discussion, Jude, but I wonder if you can come back to the points that Jules has just raised there, because I actually think he's got a point, hasn't he, on the fact that there are w entire workforces, industries. Think of the number of coffee chains. Think of the number of small little shops that people use in between their breaks and things like this. They would be lost, wouldn't they? Well, I think I think they would change, but whether they'd necessarily be lost is a different thing. With with the modern age, we're ordering food home and ordering things home far more than so it's just we do changing. now. If I, if I want to get a coffee sent to me now, I could easily do it, and I don't okay. think it's going to get rid well, of those places. Well, we're going to have to end it there, them. unfortunately, but thank you very much to both of you, Jules and Jude. Now, folks, you have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. I'm going to be back with you after the weather. 
Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking fine with some late sunshine in the southeast, but cloudier and wetter elsewhere. Here's the details. A closer look at the southwest, and here it's going to turn cloudier by the evening, with some outbreaks of rain likely, particularly for Cornwall and North Devon. In the southeast and around London, it will be a decent end to the day, with some late sunshine for most here. Cloud will bring some rain across the parts of Wales this evening. It shouldn't be too heavy though, and there will be some breaks in the cloud. A similar picture for the West Midlands, where things will be a little damp due to a few spots of rain pushing in from the west. For many, it's going to be cloudy. It will be a little brighter, perhaps, in the northeast of England. There should be some evening sunshine around, but also a few showers, which could be a touch heavy. Across much of Scotland, it will be a wet end to the day with the heaviest rain in the northwest. Some localised flooding is possible as we go through the night. It will be something of a mixed bag for Northern Ireland with some bright or sunny spells, but also a little showery rain lingering through the evening and overnight. The heaviest rain will clear Scotland overnight, but further outbreaks here and for Northern Ireland too, turning drier for England and Wales. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Cheers very much for your company. You're watching on telly, listening on DAB or watching online. This hour we're going to be looking at a tiny North Yorkshire village with a population of under a thousand. It's set to host a new asylum seeker processing facility that could hold as many as 1,500 single men. We'll get the latest on monkeypox and we'll celebrate Wrexham becoming Wales' seventh city. But first, it's the news with Bethany.
Thanks, Darren. Good afternoon. It's one minute past three. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. The Rail Maritime and Transport Workers Union says any attempt by the government to make rail strike action illegal will be met with the fiercest resistance. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps told the Sunday Telegraph ministers are considering introducing a minimum staff requirement during rail strikes. It comes as more than 40,000 RMT union members at Network Rail and train operators vote on whether to take industrial action over jobs, pay and conditions. The Home Secretary will urge MPs to avoid mob rule and support the government's new public order bill tomorrow. Priti Patel will try to reintroduce measures which have been previously blocked by the House of Lords, including up to six months in prison for obstructing a major transport network. Number 10 says the Prime Minister did not request a meeting with senior civil servant Sue Gray and that he hasn't tried to influence the outcome of her investigation into Partygate. Labour called on Boris Johnson to urgently explain what they'd discussed. Deputy Labour leader Angela Rayner says people deserve to know the truth. Two cabinet ministers have objected to imposing a windfall tax on oil and gas firms. Labour says the tax revenue can be used to ease the burden of rising household bills. But the Health Secretary and Northern Ireland Secretary say it won't work and it could have long-term impact on businesses. Greg Marsh is the CEO of Noose, a company which is helping families navigate the cost of living crisis. He told GB News regulators could do more to stop energy prices rising. We believe that the government will have to do more. We think that there will need to be intercession. One of the things they could do, for instance, is use the existing regulators, Ofcom and Ofgem, who regulates the communications industry and the energy industry, to put more pressure on the regulated providers of energy, the regulated providers of mobile phone services and broadband services, to ensure that those companies aren't increasing their prices above the rate of inflation, which is something many of them are doing. Ukraine has ruled out a ceasefire or concessions to Moscow as Russian forces intensify an offensive on the eastern region of Donbass. US President Joe Biden has signed a bill to provide £30 billion in military, economic and humanitarian aid. Meanwhile, the Kremlin has cut off its gas supply to Finland after they refused Moscow's demands to pay in rubles. Ukraine's presidential adviser says Kyiv wouldn't accept any deal that involves giving up territory. Any concession to the Russian Federation would instantly lead to an escalation of the war. So the war will not stop. It will just be put on pause for some time. After a while, with renewed intensity, the Russians will build up their weapons, manpower and work on their mistakes. And they'll start a new offensive, even more bloody and large scale. The Education Secretary has said he's determined to make personal tutoring free for every pupil. In the Sunday Express, Nadim Zahawi said one-on-one -on -one teaching could become a part of the national curriculum to help those who've fallen behind during the pandemic. But Kerry Packman, who's the Executive Director of ParentKind, told GB News parents don't have enough information to take advantage of the scheme. I just can't see that happening unless they actually give break down those barriers and give parents the information and in order for parents to go into the school and actually ask about is my child going to get this they won't do that unless they've got the information behind them a woman launching a legal battle in northern ireland after waiting five years for a diagnosis says she hopes her case will help others Eileen Wilson has yet to be formally diagnosed after being referred by her GP in June 2017 for showing symptoms of MS. The mother of six will argue the length of waiting lists is unlawful and that they breach human rights. It's just not known. It's just that constant fear. There's people dying in waiting lists and it's, it's just not, it's not fair. You know, those people can't get appointments, even cancer patients can't get appointments, it's just horrible. 
Australia's Labour Party will form the country's new government from tomorrow. Unprecedented support for the Greens and climate-focused independents ended nearly a decade of rule by the Conservative coalition. Local media reports Labour, which hasn't been in power since 2013, is just shy of a 76-seat majority, and they may need support of smaller independent parties. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens now. Let's get back to Darren. Welcome to Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Here's what's coming up on the show over the next hour. Linton on Ousa has a population of under a thousand, but it's set to host a new asylum seeker processing facility that could hold 1,500 single men. Locals aren't too happy about it. We'll be joined by one of them. Monkeypox, the outbreak that was first identified in the UK, is spreading across Europe. We'll be going back to basics on what the condition is and how we can prevent catching it. And in our Scrap Reform Keep segment, we're looking at free mental health checkups offered to state school students. Will they help young people or actually just cause more anxiety? That's what we're talking about for the next hour. I'd love to know your thoughts, so much more important than me own. Tweet me at GB News or email me on gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can watch online on YouTube and don't forget about Facebook. Our page is bustling with content. Cheers very much. Cheers for your company. First up to Northern Ireland, where a lot of attention we're, this week will be based around the second reading of a controversial new bill. It's making its way through Parliament. It's designed to process the legacy of the Troubles, but in a more balanced way. Up until now, the majority of cases have concentrated on former members of the security forces. None have been convicted, but veterans have been campaigning for a more balanced approach. GB News's Dougie Beatty reports. Issues around legacy have been haunting the peace agreement for nearly a quarter of a century. Letters of comfort given to the IRA by the then Prime Minister Tony Blair made sure their victims would never find the truth out about who killed their loved ones. British servicemen would not be afforded that protection and for many years they have had to defend themselves in courts and without state support. A bill now being passed through Westminster intends to correct that. Paul Young of the Veterans Movement explains. Our understanding of what's been proposed at the moment with this new system, is uh, this new commission, is that once that becomes law, the whole legacy industry, lawfare if you like, in Northern Ireland, will cease to exist. That means that any soldier or police officer that has been previously investigated before, their fires will be seen by this new commission and they should be given immunity from prosecution and then the files stored away never to see the light of day. This bill will itself create many more legal battles and some legal firms have already registered over 70 cases in order to try and beat the bill as it becomes law. It is expected that the Secretary of State will remove immunity from any former letters of comfort and those that do not cooperate with the new commission may still face prosecution. The Irish Taoiseach or Prime Minister Miho Martin is not in favour and says it's an amnesty. Uh, fundamentally, um, you know, I'm very much opposed to what the British government is proposing here uh, in terms of um, essentially uh, the, the, the guts of an amnesty for people who committed terrible crimes, irrespective of whether they're uh, security forces or members of various paramilitary groups who committed terrible crimes. Uh, and for, for many of those paramilitary groups, uh, this is literally a get out of jail uh, legislation uh, from any further investigation. Whatever the rights and wrongs around legacy, legal costs here are massive and without one conviction. It's thought. This bill will become law in the next few months. Doogie Beattie, GB News, Belfast. Quite the report from Doogie there. Next up, folks, Linton on Ouse, a tiny North Yorkshire village with a population of under 1,000. It's set to host a new asylum seeker processing facility that could hold 
1,500 single men. It actually means that 70% of residents are going to be asylum seekers. And the first men could arrive in just weeks. Locals are less than happy, I think it's safe to say, with the plan to build the centre in a former RAF station on the outskirts of the village. They spoke to GB News about their concerns. Everyone is saying that it's the wrong place to put 1,500 asylum seekers. There's no facilities for them. We're not against the refugees. If it was 1,500 British white lads, it would still be the same. It's overpowering. It would mean for our village that the asylum seekers outweigh the villagers by three to one, which is very intimidating for people living in the village, the community. It's upsetting. Yeah, it's just really about like safety for us women. I feel like there's no safety put in place. And, um, and um, it's things like me and my friend going out for a run. Um, we will no longer be able to do that anymore. Um, yeah, it's, it's singly or in a group, I just don't feel safe at all. Quite the report there. Would you feel confident with one of these asylum seeker processing centres in your area? This week, Kevin Hollenrake, the local MP, has said that the centre would devastate the community. Pretty strong stuff. So joining me now is Dr Olga Matthias from Linton on Who's Action Group. Olga, thank you very much for your company today. Do you actually agree with Kevin Hollingrake, your MP there? Do you actually feel like you're getting good representation on this issue? Darren, I think Kevin's doing a superb job at trying to knock some sense, shall we say, into the Home Office. Uh, I'd like to just pick you up on one thing that you said when you introduced this uh, article on your programme. The RAF station is not on the outskirts of the village. It's actually slap bang in the middle of the village. There's one road and as you get to about halfway down the road, you turn into the entrance of the RAF base. So it does Migrant Centre is going to be, start. it's at the very heart, isn't it, of the community it's then? It's at the very the heart, yes. Yeah. And that just... So it, yes, how Kevin's much, doing a good job. And how <laughs> successful is your campaign then ultimately? Have you ever seen the community so incensed about an issue before? I just want to clarify with you, Darren, that the, the community is incensed with the Home Office. It's the Home Office behaviour that has gone counter to anything that we in this country should expect from our, our government. They've gone against every single regulation, guideline or policy that they have set out, that they as a government have let us, the population, know that is a framework of behaviour. They are accountable to us, their first duty is to look after and keep the population safe. They have um, rules about consultation. There has been zero consultation on this. The first that was uh, heard was on the 14th of April when it was announced. On the 21st of April, uh, there was a, a village meeting. And after that meeting is when multi-agency meetings started to discuss the implications of what was going on. Tripling the population of anywhere is a very, very difficult matter. Uh, the water people, the fire, police, nobody knew. Now, yeah. one of the guidelines that the Home Office has uh, stated for open and transparent government is that um, consultation should be targeted and proportionate. Now, bless them, presumably they were trying to look after us because at the very end of that consultation guideline, it does say, um, in an effort to reduce, let me just try and remember, in an effort to reduce the risk of consultation fatigue, um, we will make sure that we only consult on issues that are genuinely undecided. Now, to me, that means that they yeah. were always... There's no democratic consent there, is there? That's the, no yeah. democratic consent whatsoever. Exactly. On that point, those who don't want, in my opinion, and I've said this, those who don't want channel migrant hubs being set up in their towns or villages are far too often dismissed as being some kind of bigot, right? But actually, if you ask me, 
to fundamentally, to actually put one that many people into a community that is much smaller than the number of people that could eventually be arriving in the centre of the community would fundamentally alter it, right? And as you say, with no democratic consent. And ultimately, it's also got now to do with skin colour, in my opinion, and it's got everything to do with people who have, frankly, broken in to our country being offered bed and board on the taxpayer. A lot of people have real issue with that. <laughs> Possibly so, Darren. I know that's probably your, you know, one, one of the points of interest for you. But we as an action group, what we are purely focusing on is, as you rightly said just earlier, the undemocratic behaviour of the Home Office. In the village, as, as a couple of the clips that you showed when you were live in the village um, on Thursday, we are not against asylum seekers at all in any way, shape or form. What we are against is the disproportionate behaviour of the Home Office to put 1,500 people in a village of 700. Plus, there are going to be, Serco has announced that there are 300 employees being recruited. So that's 1,800 people versus 700. That's three to one nearly. Um, imagine that in London. Imagine three to one. That would be, uh, what, 25, 30 million refugees coming into London for the same yeah. proportion? Puts it in Is perspective. that sensible? Yeah, I mean, the Home Office have actually said that the centre would help end our reliance on expensive hotels, which are costing the taxpayer £4.7 million a day, and that it's actually engaging with local stakeholders about the use of the site. Are they engaging with you? As I've said, they are engaging now, but probably because they have to, probably because we as an action group have uh, managed to get ourselves on their radar. It's interesting you mentioned the 4.7 million a day. At the last meeting on um, Thursday when the Home Office came, we asked them specifically, one of the people in the village hall said, can you tell us how much per asylum seeker per day is spent in order to arrive at that 4.7 million. And can you tell us how much the costings for this new asylum processing centre in Linton on Ooze will be per asylum seeker per day? Laughably, in my opinion, the Home Office answer was that information is confidential. Well, I now mean, you and, make and of that, that what. Yeah, exactly. So that's finish, quite Aaron, extraordinary. You, it is, isn't it? So you make of that what you will. We, yeah. the tax, they're, they're spending our money. They're telling us the information is confidential. Now, either they have completely uh, abandoned any attempt of accountability to the taxpayer and to transparent government, or they haven't actually done the sums and they have no idea whether it's going to be cheaper or more expensive. I'll leave that to you maybe to pursue with somebody else in another interview. Well, indeed, indeed, indeed. I mean, ultimately, I think if the government doesn't get serious on this, Olga, they're going to have to answer to more than just a few people in the action group that you guys have managed to muster in Linton on Ooze. But Dr Olga Matthias from the Linton on Ooze action group, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome, Darren. Thank you. Now, folks, it's time for Grime Watch, a time to look at what you at home have been saying about the stories we've covered here on Real Britain. And we had a fair number, I think it's safe to say, of responses to a story that we ran yesterday that we didn't have time to read out. It was about the Cambridge police who were criticised after sharing pictures of Superintendent James Sutherland wearing the brightly coloured rainbow helmet while patrolling Cambridge on Monday. We don't allow the armed forces folks to traipse around the world draped in the colours of the rainbow like an armed to the teeth clown. In my view, why should the police be any different? Plenty of you gave your thoughts on that very issue. Mary thinks I'm completely wrong. She said, why on earth would a community policeman with a rainbow helmet, which presumably supports LGBTQ, showing support for equality, offend you? Well, Mary, it doesn't offend me, but I think that actually the police should get on with other more pressing priorities. If they're spending all this time painting helmets and painting cars, they're not focusing on bang uh, putting prisoners, uh, actually criminals, into the prisons that, and actually solving the crimes that we want them to. That's my issue. 
John says the police are supposed to be a neutral apolitical organisation. Hear, hear, John. Unfortunately, this is an overtly political statement which indicates a particular alignment. And John's right. There are many contentious issues in the, the modern-day LGBTQ plus movement, especially around the issue of the erasure of women from our national picture. Oliver said, oh, because a policeman wearing a rainbow hat is going to remove all respect for the police. Well, yes, I think he is. Oliver, what hardened criminal is going to look at a copper wearing the, what looks like Joseph's Technicolor rainbow hat that he's got on and actually think, do you know, that's a man that I fear. That's a man that I've got all respect for. That's a man that I think is going to enforce law and order here in Britain. You look like a clown. Laura said, why is no one asking why they are wasting their time and budget on proving how inclusive they are? And Laura, that goes to the heart of what we were discussing at the top of the show there at two o'clock, which I think is the capture of many public taxpayer-funded institutions to this wackery and wokery, and the police actually focusing on that more than they do on law and order, and that's wrong. Libby had this to say, though. Police showing support and solidarity to LGBTQ plus community, the NHS employing equality and diversity managers. Why is it that these approaches designed to ensure inclusivity and avoid discrimination and inequality is being peddled by media as the problem? Because I don't think ultimately that it is doing that. I actually think that these moves to pursue pos so-called positive discrimination, in my view, there is no such thing now as positive discrimination. Any form of discrimination is wrong. That's my view. Let me know yours, though. GBviews at gbnews.uk. And plenty more to come on this afternoon on Real Britain. Next, we'll be popping over to my virtual classroom to talk about monkeypox. But first, let's have a look at the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking fine with some late sunshine in the southeast, but cloudier and wetter elsewhere. Here's the details. A closer look at the southwest and here it's going to turn cloudier by the evening with some outbreaks of rain likely, particularly for Cornwall and North Devon. In the southeast and around London, it will be a decent end to the day with some late sunshine for most here. Cloud will bring some rain across the parts of Wales this evening. It shouldn't be too heavy though and there will be some breaks in the cloud. A similar picture for the West Midlands where things will be a little damp due to a few spots of rain pushing in from the west. For many it's going to be cloudy. It will be a little brighter perhaps in the northeast of England. There should be some evening sunshine around but also a few showers which could be a touch heavy. Across much of Scotland, it will be a wet end to the day with the heaviest rain in the northwest. Some localised flooding is possible as we go through the night. It will be something of a mixed bag for Northern Ireland with some bright or sunny spells, but also a little showery rain lingering through the evening and overnight. The heaviest rain will clear Scotland overnight, but further outbreaks here and for Northern Ireland too, turning drier for England and Wales. And that's how the weather's shaping up overnight into tomorrow morning. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners a paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4pm until 6pm, 
as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. Join me, Gloria De Piero, Monday to Thursday at noon for The Briefing. We go to the parts of Parliament that you won't see elsewhere. Plus, there's exclusive interviews with MPs from all parties. But quite often, they paper over the real truth. Why does a working class lad like you join the Tories? That's a good question. Don't miss it. Monday to Thursdays at noon on GB News. Welcome back to Real Britain, folks. Now, coming up, Israel and Switzerland are the latest countries to confirm cases of this monkeypox business, bringing in the total number of nations reporting outbreaks to 14. It was first identified here in Britain. We're getting quite fortunate with this stuff, aren't we? Let's go back to basics now and find out what actually is this monkeypox. I'm joined by the epidemiologist, Dr. Roland Salmon. Dr. Salmon, I must say you've got a fantastic name, but could you please tell us what is monkeypox? Yeah, sure, Darren. Um, monkeypox is uh, a viral infectious disease that clinically looks a bit like a mild form of smallpox. It was first identified as a human infection in Central Africa in 1970. And during the 1970s, a lot of interest was taken in these pox type diseases because it was, of course, during that decade that smallpox was being eliminated. So where there were outbreaks of other pox like illnesses, they were investigated pretty closely. For many, many years, it was restricted to remote rural communities in uh, Central and West Africa. And then really, we've got to roll the clock forward till about the 2000s, when there was a big outbreak in, well, I say big, tens of cases in the United States associated with the importation as sort of exotic pets of Gambian rats. These in turn um, infected prairie dogs, and this led to uh, a number of cases in the United States. As a disease, uh, you're showing some rather gruesome pictures of, uh, of the sort of uh, vesicles that you get with this disease, which do look a lot like, uh, uh, like smallpox vesicles, it has to be said, while I'm speaking. Uh, these usually come on after 6 to 16 days of fairly close contact with another human case, or much more commonly uh, in, the original, um, in the original cases, with exposure to um, infected animals, particularly um, you know, the butchering of primates for, for bushmeat in, in the Congo and things like that in the 1970s. Latterly, cases have always been associated either with contact with affected animal, imported animals, or with travel. What's 
unusual and of interest about this recent um, uh, number of cases in the 11 countries that they've been reported is that apparently a number of the cases don't have uh, any particular contact with someone who's been traveling abroad. So therefore, they demanded rather closer attention. There have been uh, the reports actually saying here that the monkeypox campaign will target gay men. Why is that? Well, a number, a number of these, these current cases, as I understand it, have occurred in men who have sex with men. Now, the question you've got here slightly is, are you seeing them here because that's where we're looking? I mean, clearly sexual encounters are of their very nature close encounters, but um, historically with monkeypox, um, it was possible to get spread within um, within households as well, households uh, you know where people were living on a family basis. Um, I think perhaps the emphasis in, in the story on gay men arises partly from the fact that there is some concern that if you like this virus having got out of uh, got out of the the rainforest might now be establishing a new niche a new environmental niche as if you like a sexually transmitted disease right um, if it is I think there's one or two things perhaps to bear in mind about it the first thing is you're only infectious with monkeypox, as far as anyone knows, once you've got symptoms. Yes. When you've got symptoms, that's pretty visible. You've just been showing the pictures of that. The incubation period, I think I've mentioned, is something like 4 to 21 days, usually 6 but, to 16 days. So it's quite long. And finally, yeah. there's no carrier state in which you're infectious, like there is, say, with syphilis or HIV. So if it is being transmitted that way, it's the sort of disease that sexually transmitted infection services, if they're functioning well, should be able to deal with pretty effectively. Yeah, yes. And they're, of course, saying that they're not functioning very well at the moment. But Dr. Salmon, I wonder, just in a word, if you will, because we're out of time, sure. should we be fearful of this? I get asked this question an awful lot about all sorts of things, Darren, down the years. I think my view is that don't panic, Captain Mannering, but yes, let's show some intelligent concern. Here's a preventable disease that we can prevent, so let's get on and do that. I couldn't have put it better. Dr. Roland Salmon, thank you very much for speaking to us this afternoon. Yep. Now, folks, very welcome, here's a with Darren. GB News on TV and DAB radio. Next, we'll be discussing whether social media channels should be scrutinised for hosting material which promotes gender transition. The author, Laura Dodsworth, will join me to discuss. But folks, it's now time for a check on the news headlines. It's 33 minutes past two. I'm Ray Addison in the GB Newsroom. The Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers Union says any attempt by the government to make rail strike action illegal will be met with the fiercest resistance. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps told the Sunday Telegraph ministers are considering introducing a minimum staff requirement during rail strikes. More than 40,000 RMT union members are voting on whether to take major industrial action over pay. Two cabinet ministers have objected to imposing a windfall tax on oil and gas firms as part of plans to tackle the cost of living crisis. Labour says the tax revenue could be used to ease the burden of rising household bills. However, the Health Secretary and the Northern Ireland Secretary say it won't work and would have a long-term impact on businesses. The cost of living gap between rich and poor households has reached the highest since records began in 2006. The Resolution Foundation has found inflation for the poorest tenth has now hit 10.2%. as compared with 8.7% for the richest. Ukraine has ruled out a ceasefire or concessions to Moscow as Russian forces intensify an offensive in the eastern region of Donbass. Ukraine's presidential advisor says Kyiv wouldn't accept any deal that involves giving up territory. Meanwhile, the Kremlin has cut off its gas supply to Finland after they refused Moscow's demands to pay in rubles. Australia's Labour Party will form the country's new government from tomorrow. Unprecedented support for the Greens and climate-focused independents ended nearly a decade of rule by the Conservative coalition. Local media report that Labour is just short of a majority of 76 seats and may need the support of smaller independent parties. 
On TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll be back to Real Britain with Darren Grimes after this short break. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. Now, folks, at the beginning of the show, I gave my view on how gender ideology isn't just a problem on Twitter, but is harming actually women in, out there in the real world. So my next topic is about the content which appears on social media feeds that actually looks like it endorses, and some people claim promotes, gender transition. I'm asking this afternoon, should social media platforms be worried about this kind of content? Well, joining me is Laura, Laura Dodsworth, an author of A State of Fear, and she's written about this very issue. Laura, thank you very much for your company. How concerned are you about this sort of content? Because some might say, Laura, that actually there needs to be awareness of this, these issues because far too many kids, for example, may be at risk of suicide. Yeah, I think it is a really important issue. I mean, everyone's aware that in recent months and years, women's sports, prisons, even the very basic question of what a woman is have become a metaphorical battlefield. The problem is that detransitioned women, so that's women who thought they were trans and then changed their mind, they actually bear the literal scars of this battle. So there is quite a lot of content on social media that reaches out to trans people and you can see it as a celebration of being trans and important introductory information. I found when looking at it, it's generally quite unbalanced. Let me describe one image for you that was on Instagram. Picture somebody called a top surgeon. This is a surgeon who conducts bilateral mastectomies on young women with gender dysphoria, that is, removes the breasts. He was posing for a Christmas photograph wearing a Santa hat and in each hand he was carrying a medical waste bucket and each bucket was labelled with breast tissue. So this is presumably supposed to be a celebration of transition but what it effectively said is that female flesh is trash. Now there's been a lot of discussion recently about whether the government should ban conversion therapy for gay people and for trans therapy and I think the government has reached the right decision in saying that it has to be very careful not to restrict legitimate talking therapy for young people who are questioning their gender identity to help them explore what factors may be behind it and to make sure they don't go down the wrong path. 
My big worry is that by the time young people get to that first doctor's appointment, they've already been affirmed, you could even say groomed, by some of the content that they see online. Um, there's a, a, a new series of videos which has been created by Pink News um, on Snapchat. And bear in mind that Snapchat's biggest demographic is teenage girls aged 13 to 17. And it's called Pure Trans Joy. And the first episode is all about top surgery, that is to say, bilateral mastectomy. It didn't contain any words of caution, no caveats, no explanations of different reasons why my girls might be very uncomfortable with their developing body or be questioning their identity. Instead, it talked only about euphoria, freedom, and even the bliss of fairy dust. Um, when it comes to removing your breasts. And I do think we have to be so careful with this young, with this cohort of young people about the content that they're encountering online, which may send them down a medical path. Laura, what do you think explains, I mentioned at the start of the show, there has been a massive increase since I was at school. I left school in 2009. If you consider mm. the increase over that time, it's not a very long period of time. And the increase yeah. in the number of people that say at school that claim to be experiencing gender dysphoria, where does this come from? Well, there is a, um, a theory, it's quite a controversial theory out there called rapid onset gender dysphoria. And this explains the increase um, as being caused by social contagion, peer contagion, internet contagion, much in the way that, say, eating disorders are known to spread as well. That's one explanation. Another explanation is that because there's increased acceptance and visibility of trans people, young people are more confident about exploring their gender identity and asking for referral. But I don't think that does explain all of it. Back in 2009, 70 children were referred to the Tavistock um, and Portman Gender Identity Clinic. By 2019, it was over two and a half thousand. Now, the big difference is not just the number, but the case mix ratio. So that went from 75% uh, boys to 75% girls, approximately 75%. So what's accounted for that change? And I think that um, this theory of rapid onset gender dysphoria may well be um, a very valid way of explaining the phenomena. The thing is, what we'd really like is this uh, is an explanation from the gender identity clinics. And this is where the CAS review, which is a review into um, the treatment of gender identity on the NHS, has found that the clinics have been remiss. They can't really explain the change in the case mix ratio. So I think it's definitely one to watch. And that's why the idea of um, unbalanced content on social media really matters when the biggest demographic is young teenage girls. So Laura, then would you be actually calling on Nadine Dorries, who's the Secretary of State for the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. She's putting through Parliament right now the government's online harms bill. This has been coming down the tracks for a number of years now. It's quite a contentious issue. There's a lot of, I think, scrutiny over that bill in particular. But would you like it to be expanded even further to limit this type of content, which, as you say, could potentially be influencing young ladies? I think the problem is that if you just try and fix what's happening on social media, it's putting a sticking plaster on one aspect of the problem. Actually, the affirmative pathway itself could be part of the problem. Um, we have to see where the CAS review ends up going. In fact, the Advertising Standards Authority and the General Medical Council have introduced new advertising guidelines which come into force this week, I think, which says that plastic surgeons can't advertise on platforms where a certain percentage of the audience are, are young people. They have to be really careful about it. At the moment, you've got a plethora of these so-called top surgeons on social media. And it'll be interesting to see whether they change how they run their accounts or if there are any complaints about them. I've got to say I'm cautious about expanding the remit of the online harms bill, which is already very subjective and has been described as a census charter. I think we need um, a much bigger cultural investigation into this phenomena, into the, the changing case mix ratio. At the moment, the platforms do have guidelines to prevent um, undue influence, promotion of self-harm, various things. Now, if this pink news video was instead a video about the joys of breast enhancement surgery, there would be vitriol. People would be really angry about it, and quite rightfully so. But because 
it's about removing breasts for gender dysphoria. It's though it's been sprinkled with a, a magic dust of acceptability, but actually it's encouraging girls to go down a path which is completely irreversible and is a very serious surgery. I don't really know what the answer is, but I think we're at a stage in society where there are lots of big discussions happening right now about, like I said, even the basic questions of what it means to be a man and a woman, and it's all wrapped up together. Well, indeed. But why is it, in your view, that actually these platforms, social media platforms, they're very happy to slap content they don't like, which could be politically contentious, with disinformation warnings or, you know, did you mean to tweet this or what have you? There will be all sorts of disclaimers and disinformation warnings. Why is it on this particular issue they view it, and I'm assuming that this is the case, I of course haven't actually spoken to any of these social media giants, so please don't sue me. Why is it that actually on this issue it gets a free pass. This content is just allowed to be put out there ad nauseum. Whatever you want to post on this issue will be accepted mm -hmm. because actually it's really quite serious what these, what these kids are actually being exposed to, isn't yeah. it? I think there's a few things going on. One is that transgender ideology is seen as absolutely acceptable. There's never been a more welcoming counterculture. You wouldn't get the same content, um, like I said, about self-harm or breast enhancement surgery, which are two similar parallels to the idea of having a bilateral mastectomy in your teens or early 20s. So there's a veneer of acceptability about it. Um, secondly, Honestly, I think that a vein of misogyny runs through this. Think back to that picture I described. When I saw a surgeon carrying medical waste buckets that were labelled as breast tissue, I felt sick. I felt sick. That says that, you know, girls are freighted with a sexuality and if they don't want, if they don't want that, they have to remove the, the flesh. You get top surgeons with accounts on Instagram that show before and after pictures. Now, the before pictures are covered with little digital modesty stickers over the nipples because, God forbid, you would see a girl or a woman's nipples, even though there's plenty of soft porn to be found on social media. The after photos where the girl has had the breast removed and is now a boy or a man, you know, they're a trans man, those nipples are fine, they're completely acceptable. We're talking about the exact same little square of flesh, but on one it's acceptable and on one it isn't. I think there's something that runs through this which is just misogynistic about, yeah, about female flesh. It's... It's easy to see why girls who might have uh, sexual abuse uh, or trauma in their background or who are lesbians and have encountered homophobia might be more likely to identify as trans. And in fact, I went back to some detransitioners who I'd interviewed for a previous project about this Pink News video, and one of them described it to me as a train wreck. And she said, even if it's not malicious, it's irresponsible. She only wishes that the medical profession had really tried to find out why she thought she was trans. In her case, she had um, a past of sexual abuse and she was deeply uncomfortable in her own skin. She's now detransitioned. She will always have those mastectomy scars. She'll never have her breast back. She will always have a bald patch, but she is in a much better place now. And it's yeah. people like her who have given me the confidence to urge caution about this material. Because the other thing is, Darren, if you do speak up about it, you get labelled as transphobic. And there's not a transphobic bone in my body. I'm just really worried about young girls especially, but also young boys, going down the wrong pathway. Really, really think that in the years to come, not to... I mean, we're probably there now. We're going to look back at this period and just think, what on earth have we done? But Laura, what would you say to those? You, you've mentioned the, the, uh, the banning of conversion therapy. That's there for gay men and women. It's not there for trans people. What would you say to those who actually argue we won't have achieved full equality in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland until actually we have outlawed anyone trying to convince people that they're not experiencing gender dysphoria and that actually these kids will ultimately end up harming themselves if we don't pursue this. 
I would say that they're coming from um, a place of good intentions, but this field is incredibly nuanced um, and they're misunderstanding, I think, what the therapy is that's offered to young people. In fact, there is a very affirmative medical pathway now. There's very little questioning of why, why young people do want to transition. And if it was banned, it would really restrict and stymie professionals who want to help young people explore why they're not happy with their gender, because we do know it can be multifactorial. There's a, an increased comorbidity with neurodiversity, body dysmorphia, sexual trauma, sexual abuse, rape, discovering porn at a young age, being a lesbian, being gay, encouraging, uh, encountering externalized homophobia or internalized homophobia. The doorway has to be open for all these different subjects to be discussed to make sure that the young person ends up on the right medical pathway. So important not to shut that door. And I think that although people are coming from a place of good intentions, they shouldn't really mix up, um, in this case, gay and trans rights. No, indeed. I've never, to be honest with you, I cannot for the life of me understand why the LGB also includes the T because they are very vastly different things. But that's quite a controversial statement. And Laura, as you well know, I'll probably be cancelled for the hundredth time on Twitter. Dot com. But Laura Dodsworth, hopefully you'll keep on keeping on. Thank you for your time today and contribution to Real Britain. Now, folks, in light of a mental health crisis coming out of a lockdown, a lot of people struggled with that lockdown. A new government programme has been introduced that aims to tackle mental health problems with students in state schools. Now, it's time to ask, could this be a waste of taxpayer cash or a smart way to actually address the mental health crisis in the United Kingdom? Or is calling it a crisis a step too far? Could it actually be a cause of more anxiety for teens and for young people? Well, joining me is the education commentator and editor-in-chief of The Good Schools Guide, Lord Rafe Lucas. Thank you very much for your company. Good Why afternoon. is the government introducing this programme? Well, I, it, it would be so wonderful if this was true. I mean, the name alone, Govox, the voice of Gove, uh, gives one enormous confidence. Uh, but really, this needs to be the greatest possible caution. Uh, the website doesn't contain any evaluations. There's no advice on there as to what teachers should do, no experience as to how parents and children handle this. It's been developed with adults. It's not a children's program. There are red flags here. As, as with your, uh, your previous session, we, we just don't seem to realize how carefully and with what respect we need to treat children's mental health. Uh, and to do this just as if, oh, it's, it's, it's an app. It, it'll be wonderful. It'll provide an immediate solution. Uh, there's far too much hope in there and far too little caution. So yeah, I, Lord Lucas, I, I, one I thing really I would we say, take this slowly. one thing I would say is actually, I think there are far too, far too often these days Concerns around whether that be, I don't know, what it, it could be someone robs a shop or something like that, for example. Someone is a little unruly in their youth. It's dismissed, dismissed as, oh, well, this person you see is suffering mental health issues. And actually, a lot of my viewers may well be of the view that they're the, under the umbrella of mental health, we are dismissing unruly behaviour with children. Do you think, do you fear that? Or do you think this is the right approach? We should be talking about these issues and shining a light on something that's been dismissed for far too long. I, I think this need, think, needs taking properly and professionally and carefully. You're absolutely right. There's a lot of uh, saying this is a mental health issue when actually it's just ordinary life, ordinary growing up, uh, the usual cares. But on the other hand, uh, looking back at the time when an awful lot of girls used to get eating disorders, a lot still do. Uh, there are real mental health issues. Some children really suffer from depression. But diagnosing that, knowing what's true, knowing what's actually happening is, is a professional thing. And that it should be all crammed into an app and something that children are almost being asked to diagnose themselves on the basis of what the app says to them. And we're back in the territory that, that you were in in your, in your previous session of 
of not caring for children in the way that we should. Not yes, and I think there is a, a real issue take there. take good decisions. Lord, look, on the point of, of state schools, just briefly, if you would, because we're just coming to the end of the programme, are state school students more likely to suffer from mental health issues than private school kids? I don't think so. I think it's uh, it's there in both systems. And, and certainly it, the, the, there's a history of eating disorders and suicides in, pri in private schools, uh, just as there is in, in, in state schools. No, it, and in some ways, uh, the, uh, the rarefied atmosphere of a, an independent school potentially can cause problems. But no, it's there in both, and both taking it seriously. And there are some really good programs uh, like Toe to Toe, which, which, which are proven to help, and the Anna Freud Center and all the work they do. Uh, that, that should be encapsulated in an app. Well, we're going to have to leave it there, but Lord, I don't because thank you very much for your time today. That was Lord Lucas, education commentator and editor-in-chief of The Good Schools Guide. Thank you for your time. Folks, you have been watching Real Britain with me, Darren Grimes. Thank you ever so. The show's on every Saturday and Sunday at 2pm, but for now, here's the weather. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking fine with some late sunshine in the southeast, but cloudier and wetter elsewhere. Here's the details. A closer look at the southwest and here it's going to turn cloudier by the evening with some outbreaks of rain likely, particularly for Cornwall and North Devon. In the southeast and around London, it will be a decent end to the day with some late sunshine for most here. Cloud will bring some rain across the parts of Wales this evening. It shouldn't be too heavy though, and there will be some breaks in the cloud. A similar picture for the West Midlands, where things will be a little damp due to a few spots of rain pushing in from the west. For many, it's going to be cloudy. It will be a little brighter, perhaps, in the northeast of England. There should be some evening sunshine around, but also a few showers, which could be a touch heavy. Across much of Scotland, it will be a wet end to the day with the heaviest rain in the northwest. Some localised flooding is possible as we go through the night. It will be something of a mixed bag for Northern Ireland with some bright or sunny spells, but also a little showery rain lingering through the evening and overnight. The heaviest rain will clear Scotland overnight, but further outbreaks here and for Northern Ireland too, turning drier for England and Wales. And that's how the weather's shaping up 